Welcome to Legends and Leadership. I'm Jack Myers. The Legends and Leadership series is hosted at MediaVillage.org and is also available at YouTube and all your favorite podcast platforms. It's about a year ago that Shirley Zeltzer and I met uh, at the Cannes Lions International Festival of Advertising, and we talked about a lot of the emerging realities around artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so many other data and analytics related topics. So I'm really pleased to be joined today on Legends and Leadership by Shirley Zeltzer. Shirley is Chief Data and Technology Officer at Dentsu. Shirley, welcome. So great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, and and I have to just open with your your bio, which is pretty daunting, frankly. Uh, with over 20 years' experience in analytics and insights, business advisory and organizational design, artificial intelligence and data science, and cloud and marketing technologies, uh, you surely uh, have been at the forefront for many years of innovation. Uh, ranging from ethical AI and advancements in cloud engineering to future-proofing data literate organizations around zero-party data. Really, let, let's just start by my asking you if you could unpack all, all of that uh, uh, kind of really deep in the woods uh, roles that, that you've had. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've spent my career, you know, it started out in analytics, although quite frankly, back when I started, we didn't even call it analytics. It was statisticians and statistics and then evolved into analytics and then data science as we got more sophisticated and then AI and machine learning came in and then, you know, more sophisticated AI and generative AI. So I've sort of been on, on that path in my whole career. And then obviously working very heavily with client data with third party data and then really starting to understand how important it is for organizations to own their data and to to connect with their clients to gain that zero party data um and then you know as a natural result of all of that work it was all about how do you store the data how do you make sure that it's in a privacy safe environment but still being able to access it and all of the cloud technology that became available and working in clean rooms so that you can connect different pieces of data that you typically wouldn't be able to connect and get results and get insights out of it. So that's sort of been how everything has tied together throughout my career and come together. So, of course, you spent many years at Merkle, uh, which has now been your role at Merkle has been folded within the, the Dentsu group. And and Dentsu seems to have really made a really built a a primary focus around data and analytics uh, globally. Where where do you fit into the total uh, uh, Dentsu infrastructure in terms of bringing data and analytics to the forefront for your clients? Yeah, I mean I, it's really exciting to me. Dentsu is really been focused on the fact that data and technology is what is going to be a key differentiator and what powers um, everything that we do from media to creative to customer experiences. So we made the decision to centralize the data and technology organization at Dentsu. And so um, pulling in the analytics and insights and and the different products that we had across the organization and the, and you know the focus on technology. So um, this group sits centrally and is meant to be in support of all of our different practice areas and brands um, so that we can really be um, led with the data and technology and the power that that brings. In 2023, uh, the Myers report did a a study of uh, 565 research uh, data and analytics professionals in the advertising and marketing business. And what we learned is when we drilled down into their actual knowledge, their their ability to, uh, to present to clients on things like clean rooms, uh, attribution, attention measures, uh, first party data versus third party data, even these practitioners of research and an analytics, only 35% said they felt they were actually competent to 
describe and talk about the work they're doing in, in a way that could uh, educate others. So how are you confronting the reality that so many of your colleagues in the business and especially at clients may not really understand the, the role and realities of data as it's accelerating so quickly? I mean, that's a reality that we face every day as well. And I think that we focus a lot on educating, right? Educating internally, educating our clients and making sure that they understand the importance of it. But to me, it's always done through use cases and outcomes, right? It's it's very different when you explain to somebody what a clean room is from a technical standpoint versus what is the problem you're actually trying to solve and then going back to the role that a clean room would play in it. So, mm -hmm. so the focus for us has always been, let's talk to clients about what their issues are that we're trying to solve and, and then how technology and, and analytics play a role in solving that versus trying to explain to them what all of the tech is because it can be overwhelming. Well, especially with the acceleration of innovation, invention, and introduction of new technologies. And let's focus a bit on machine intelligence and, and generative AI and how that's fitting into your business today. I mean, it's it's playing a huge role, right? I mean, we when we talked last year in Cannes, almost exactly a year ago, just, just under, um, we talked about the emergence of all of this generative AI, and we were so excited about the potential of it. We were talking about the risks of it. And then here we are a year later, and we really are seeing a lot of that being put into action, which is you know very exciting for me in this space. Um, we're seeing how generative AI can not only impact creative and copy, but really how we're using it for, for data and for analytics and for you know more strategic parts of the business as well. So um, so to me, that that's really exciting to see. Um, but as we talked about last year, the regulation has not kept up with any of this, right? So it's really important for organizations to have a perspective on what they're using it for, what the impacts are, what some of the key risks are, and making sure that they're monitoring that and controlling for that. So a few months ago, 100 professionals, senior professionals who are focused in on machine learning and, and AI, including uh, Elon Musk and uh, the founder of OpenAI and others, uh, said they thought we should put a pause on further development, a six-month pause on further development while we dealt with the regulation around the industry. Do you, I mean, it seems like it's runaway innovation right now. Do you feel it's moving too fast and that would be helpful if we slowed down? Well, I'm I'm never one to stifle innovation. Um, so it's hard for me to say we should slow down, but I do think that everybody needs to feel that responsibility, right? Um, I, I I would never want to tell my organization or my team to to slow down. I mean, you know, Dentsu's whole tagline is innovating to impact, right? So I think that innovation is such a critical and important piece of the future and of how we're delivering our business. But everybody has to have that ownership to make sure that we're putting the right things into the market and that we are doing no harm. So I push my team very hard that we need to understand the impact of what we're doing, making sure that there's guardrails on the AI, right? We can't just, you know, build things and then set them out and not have any kind of monitoring, any kind of, you know, making sure that it's not putting, uh, generative AI is risky, right? Because it's actually generating things that you don't, so there has to be human intervention that controls and monitors and makes sure that we're doing the right thing. And then also making sure that there's not bias in what we're putting out there, because it's so easy for all of this AI to learn from the past. And unfortunately, the past has a lot of bias in it. So there's a lot of things that organizations and the people involved have to monitor and control. One of the things that I've been focusing on is the idea that uh, generative AI and, and machine intelligence are, are going to lead to a rebirth, a resurgence, a re-energizing behind the importance of creativity and the human qualities of empathy, intuition, creativity. Uh, how do you balance that within within the work you do? 
So our point of view has always been that AI cannot be a standalone. It's always going to be partnering with humans. And so the role of, of humans might change a little bit. There's a lot that the AI can do now that can take over. Um, but there's never going to be a point where we don't need that human intervention and that oversight and quite frankly, new roles that are going to be coming up as a result of what the AI is enabling. So I think that we're just going to have a shift in what the people are doing, um, both from monitoring and regulating and creating guardrails for the AI, as well as making sure that we understand how that emotion is being portrayed and making sure that we're continuing to teach the AI right things. Teach the AI, that's really the, the key. You mentioned just a minute ago, innovating to impact as the global Dentsu brand umbrella. Uh, can you explain that a bit and how it how that translates into the work you're doing? I mean, it's 100% of, of the work that we're doing, right? I think I, I love that Dentsu has put such a focus on innovation and not just innovation for the sake of innovating, but innovating to really make a difference to understand what the impact is of the innovation and, and making sure that we're we're steering it in a way that will help our clients, that will help society. Um, and so a lot of the focus of what data and tech does is that type of innovation, whether it's in support of our clients, in support of what we're seeing as gaps in the marketplace, um, but always with that intention of making sure that we're we're making the right kind of impact. Well, making the right kind of impact, and, and that takes us back to the idea of first-party data, third-party data. Can you speak a bit, uh, uh, speaking to those who may be involved in data and analytics from the uh, media content publisher and distribution side? Uh, I spoke recently to Rita Farrow, who is uh, president of Disney Advertising Sales, and uh, Rita talked about having 100 clean rooms uh, under their system and importing client data. Where do you see the agency's role evolving with data and technology in the, at the intersection of the, the media buy-sell balance? I mean, it, it, it's just like you described, right? I think that clients and organizations need to understand how important their first party data is and their first party data is it's king, right? And being able to use that to generate the right kind of audiences and the right types of experiences and the right type of creative and then pushing that into media in a way where they're protecting their first party data, but also using the power of their first party data to get better outcomes, both for them and for their customers, right? Because it makes a better experience for the customers overall. So the, the role that tech plays in that is huge because we need to ensure that we're using that first party data in the right way, that we are helping clients with understanding their, their customers' identities, pulling that through and making sure that we activate in media in a way that ties it all together and brings the best of all of these things together while still protecting the data. Where does that leave the traditional currencies, Nielsen, Comscore, uh, and more than 20 other uh, emerging competitors who are all trying to build their business into that legacy currency model, whether it's uh, attention metrics or any other metrics? Where, where do you see the traditional uh, media research business evolving to? I still think there is a role for that. I don't think that that's going to go away because we still need to sort of inform our data that we have with preferences, with behaviors, with things that we don't necessarily have from a first party standpoint. Um, that being said, I think that these companies are going to have to evolve to sort of meet with the expectation of privacy now and, and making sure that whether it's through clean rooms or whether it's through, you know, other ways of, of connecting that we're 
compliant and that we're not reliant on third party cookies and that we're not reliant on, you know, things that that are just not as acceptable anymore in the industry. So we met a year ago. We had the conversation. We were excited about what was on the horizon with our generative AI. The last year has been extraordinary in terms of uh, pick up, take up on on uh, across. Uh, it's really been an amazing year in for technology and and for the work that you do. As you're heading into Cam this year, uh, what's what's your message? What's Dense's message to its clients and and to the marketplace? Well, I think that there's <laughs> so there's a lot of things there. So one is one of the key messages around AI is making sure that you're not just using AI for the sake of AI. It's really important to understand what use cases you have and what problems you're trying to solve for, and then saying, okay, how can AI help me get there? Is it, am I trying to get better efficiency? Is it that I'm trying to create a new way of interacting with my customers? Is it, you know, and based on some of those things, we sit back and we say, okay, well, let's create that right roadmap for AI and how AI can support that. I think what a lot of, because of all of this innovation, a lot of companies are getting just overwhelmed with how do I infuse all of this AI into my business instead of saying, hey, I still have the same goals and I still have the same challenges. And so how can AI help me with those things specifically? Um, so that's message number one. And then message number two for me personally is I'm so excited to see how generative AI has come a long way in the data space, right? I think a lot of the hype and excitement last year again, was around AI and creative and AI and copy and AI and language. But now that we're thinking beyond large language models into large knowledge models and how we can bring together all of these different data sources and, and types of data that have never been able to be connected before um, and, and really be able to get meaningful insights out of those different data components and then activate them, whether it's in media or, or elsewhere, I think that's very exciting for me coming from my background and where I sit. Talking about your background, you mentioned earlier that uh, you're uh, in college and for your master's program at Cornell, you uh, focused on statistics as your major. And we didn't call it data and analytics. We called it statistics. So for college students today and those in tech schools and in the military who are uh, working in, in data and analytics, uh, what's your message in terms of career opportunities? It's the future. I mean, I'm so excited to see it. Back then, we didn't have all of the different types of programs around, you know, there's specifics around marketing analytics and around data science. And I think there's so much. And I think that that's an indication of just how much the industry has evolved and how big of a need it is. It's a, It's really at the forefront of every organization, what is your data strategy and what is your, you know, how you use your data in a meaningful way and how you gain insights and then how you optimize your business based on a feedback loop of insights. So I think that the the opportunities right now are, are huge in this space for, for people who are just starting out in their careers. Well, and in that context, uh, how can educational institutions uh, which are often very slow to evolve and move their curriculum. Uh, how do they keep up with the, the rapid rate of technological advance? It's a good question. I think that a lot of institutions actually partner with businesses and agencies to sort of see how things are being used in real life. Right? I know that we actually work with Howard University, for example, and have helped some of the professors with the subjects and, and with some of their curriculum based on the things that we do day in and day out. And I think that's been a wonderful partnership on both ends um, to help really evolve what students are seeing that is very applicable in the real world. As you look at your own career, Shirley, and the evolution of it, uh, when you started out, how challenging was it for you as a, as a woman, as a female, to find a place uh, in the industry and where do you see it evolving to now in terms of 
uh, diversity and uh, who were your some of your mentors and how are you paying it forward now? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a different landscape than it was when I was starting out. And it's funny because back then, I didn't think about how challenging it was as a woman in this industry. I just knew there were a lot of women in this industry and it 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 didn't seem to matter for lack of a better term back then. And so I think the way that it's evolved now and the importance of diversity, the importance of and the understanding of organizations that it actually benefits them to have women in leadership and to have diversity and to have equity and inclusion and having people feel like they belong where they are. Um, I think that that's a huge shift from, you know, 20 plus years ago when I was starting out. So I love seeing that. And it's funny because I think about my journey and I had amazing women mentors, but very few of them were actually in the tech space. Um, so I relied very heavily on their experiences, but had to sort of translate that to what it means in the tech world. And I think that what I try to do is um, give women that kind of support and make sure that my leadership team is diverse and um, really focus on making sure that these women that are just starting out see that they themselves, that they can see themselves in kind of more senior and and leadership type of roles in this industry. There, there was one thing that I mentioned at the beginning that I really didn't have a definition for that I'd, I'd love you to unpack for me. And that's uh, future-proofing data literate organizations on this, around zero-party data. Explain zero-party data. So zero-party data is the data that organizations can gain that their customers directly give them. So when we used to talk about first-party data, think about it like if I transacted and the company knows here's what I bought and here's how much I paid for it and here's how I'm regularly visiting their website. That's all first-party data. Zero party data is when I share my information with them, thinking that there's going to be some kind of you know benefit or knowledge exchange, whether it's through a loyalty program, whether it's through a survey, but that I directly give them my information and help them sort of know who I am as a person. And the assumption is that I will benefit from that by them, you know, making things more personalized for me from an you know an experiential standpoint. So um I think a lot of companies are starting to get that data or have that data. And it's very important to then take that data and actually use it in a meaningful way so that customers actually feel like there's value in giving that kind of data. So as you look ahead to uh, the Can Advertising Festival a year from now, do you have any predictions on what we might be talking about then that's just on the horizon now? Well, I really hope that a year from now, a lot of organizations are using AI for data purposes, the way that we've started to work on with our clients. You know, we we talked about this last year again, but the subject of ethical AI, and that's very near and dear to me and how um, we just need to make sure that when we're using all of this AI, we're doing it in a way where we don't just assume that what we're putting out there is, is going to be fine and unbiased because we train the model a certain way. There has to be a continued sense of ownership in ensuring that we're not biasing, um, that we're not you know, having unintended consequences from the AI that is creating all of this amazing stuff. Um, so the sense of responsibility and the sense of just having that be a part of the day-to-day -day of using AI. As, as a final question, Shirley, when you began in, in statistics in this industry, did you have any idea of the way that data analytic research uh, was going to leapfrog forward into such a prominent, important and leadership role in the industry? I mean, I'd love to say yes. <laughs> um, so I I was always passionate about it, right? I always thought that the way that 
we could get insights out of data should be very prominent. And, you know, I, I joined Merkle almost 19 years ago, now over 18 years ago. And that was at the forefront of Merkle even back then. So I joined an organization that I knew with, had that way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just glad that the rest of the industry is sort of, you know, caught up to that and recognizes that the importance of data and analytics and insights and bringing it all together is such a strong way of creating a better impact on your customers and therefore your organization. Shirley Zelser, Chief Data and Technology Officer at Dentsu. Thank you for joining me on Legends and Leadership is available at mediavillage.org, legendsleaders.org, at YouTube, and at all your favorite podcast platforms. Shirley, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Always great to talk to you. And I'll look forward to seeing you in camp. Absolutely.